Thank you all for joining me. As we Thank can see, you. we've got an amazing room. How's everyone feeling? Oh, yeah. Great. yeah. Looking yeah. forward to this. Yeah. So I just, I shared a little bit about my journey, you know, before you guys came on. And I think, you know, for people like ourselves, I grew up not having that many, you know, role models to look up to, young women to look up to. And I'm delighted to say all four of you are just incredible rock stars. And, and thank you for joining me today. You know, I started off being a professional footballer at the age of 14. And I knew from the age of five, I wanted to be a professional footballer. Now, growing up in South East London as a young girl, you know, I had people laugh at me. I had people say to me, that doesn't even exist. What are you talking about? And I said, watch this space. And then I became the youngest ever professional footballer in England at the age of 14. I scored on my debut for Arsenal when I was 14 years old. And some of you, I'm sure, are around that age now, you know. So it sounds crazy when I look back on my career and I think, you know, all that I did. But again, this isn't the Leanne show. I just want to give myself a little bit of credit. So Ellie, I want yeah, to come... That's amazing. Though. Thank that's you. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Ellie, I want to come to you first. Now, Paralympian... You know, absolute icon, legend. Talk to me a little bit about your experience and, you know, within the sport. Oh, thank you very much. So, yeah, go to me first. So, I'm a Paralympic swimmer. I was like you, quite young when I first rose onto the scene. My first Paralympics, I was 13. So, how old are you guys? Are you 14? 13, 14? 13, 14? 14, 15, oh, a bit of and a age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was 13 when I made my first Paralympics. But before that, um, watching Athens 2004 for me was my change in my dream. That's when my dream started. I didn't even realise that there was Paralympic sport, disability sport. I started swimming at the age of five and just to learn to swim. Swimming, not going to lie, is one of the most great sports out there, but also it's a, it's a life skill as well. I think it's really important that every single person out there can be safe in the water. But for me, it started, yeah, learning when I was five and when I, where I swam, I um, swam, started swimming competitively for my swimming club, but was swimming against people who were non-disabled. So I'm very, very competitive, um, love, Love winning, but love, yeah, not gonna lie, I do love winning. Don't we all? I think we all <laughs> like winning, don't we? But um, where it where it began really um, was Bolmere Swimming Club, competing against non disabled, like I said. And I think I wasn't doing that well. Like I was swimming all right, like swimming for them on the, on the weekend, but wasn't doing too good. And for me, watching Athens 2004 was like, oh my gosh, there's people like me on TV, there's people with different disabilities, there's the Paralympics, I want to go to a Paralympics, and that's where my dream started, and I think that that's, I think, seeing Athens, and then previously with the Paralympics, and being part of that Paralympic journey, it's been incredible to see the, the rise of Paralympic sport, and the awareness of Paralympic sport, and awareness that no matter who you are, no matter disability, colour of your skin, anything you can achieve. And it's, it's great that, to see where the Paralympics is today. And we've got um, the Olympics and Paralympics this year in Paris, which will be really, really exciting. Yeah, and I'll ask you a little bit about that visibility, you know, and how important is it having people like yourself being visible within sports and for people to aspire to be like? It's really, really important, I think, because we're all different, aren't we? And it's really important that we see people like ourselves on TV or on sports. Um, so I think representation as a whole is is yes so so important and obviously you were on strictly come dancing and i know some of you watch that show oh one God. of the I best think, on yeah. tv i think these days people know me more about strictly than my sport yeah because you're awesome but obviously there's a lot of positive things we're going to touch upon on the panel today but talk to me a little bit about you know being trolled and are there any regrets about doing strictly because we often talk about we sit here as strong powerful women that have those mindsets but there are things that come our way so you got trolled whilst you're on the show Talk to me about how you dealt with that and those feelings afterwards. Yeah, I think there's, you know, social media is incredible. I think we're all on social media, aren't we? It's amazing to, to reach people and showcase things, but also it can be quite negative as well, because I know as well, not just with um, the, the words and stuff, but you compare yourself to other people, don't you? Like I always see, like I I know like I'm, I'm small, I'm uh, since retiring, I've put a bit of weight on but still I compare myself to other people and it's hard not to but you've got to try not to also but um, I think for me on Strictly it was the most incredible experience I was a swimmer for so so many years but I got this amazing opportunity to do Strictly where you know swimming I'm used to smelling of chlorine all the time in my swimming costume you know with Strictly you get to do the whole hair the makeup all that type of thing but also it's an amazing opportunity to be the first 
person on that show with dwarfism and I think we got questioned a lot like how are we going to dance because naturally you know when you do uh, do dancing you're in that hold you know you're face to face with your partner and people are like how are they going to do it I was partnered with Nikita Kuzmin who's actually in Big Brother, Big Brother. now so let's all support him on Big Brother um, but yeah I was partnered with him and we were getting like loads of people like how are we going to do it but we did like we did um, Latin we did ballroom and we showed that you can do dance you can do anything and yes it's about adapting doing it in different ways but you can still do it and I think dancing and sport is for all and yeah you might have to get in do it in a different way but you can still get there how do you think we can make sports more open to disability do you think it's getting better i always say seeing is believing but how do you think we can make sports better i think it is getting better and better but i think it's just again the more awareness and more education i think the more inclusivity that we can be but education and awareness is definitely a big big one and i think pe teachers or teachers in general coaches i think they just need to be aware that people with disabilities can do still do it can still participate but it might be just you have to adapt and do it in a different way amazing all right we'll hear more from ellie later but i just want to say we're going to open up at the end for some questions so don't all be shy start having to think about some of the questions you want to ask this amazing panel now live diamond gladiator <laughs> so how many people watching gladiators right now okay okay how many of us watched it when we were younger yeah. everybody <laughs> I was saying to Liv, you know, I, I remember I met a couple of the gladiators when I was younger. I met Wolf and I met Cobra and I used to think Wolf was a really scary one. Those of us that are a bit older will know that. And I was like, he's actually not scary in real life. But we have a real life gladiator. What does that feel like? You know, the reaction you've had uh, from people now that it's out there. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's now out there and everyone's watching it and everyone just loves it, especially kids. And this nostalgia from those who used to watch it before as well. It's, it's awesome. And what's awesome. your training schedule like? I know I was talking to you about this off yeah. air, but like, you know, your training schedule must be crazy. Yeah, it is pretty busy. It's pretty much six, seven days a week, especially on the run up to preparing for gladiators. There's a mixture between um, like doing more functional work. Um, my body build, um, my background is bodybuilding. So that's what I do. That's where my strength has come from. That's who how Diamond got created. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's about making sure you're ready for all the games. So it's, it's very intense, but I love it. Wouldn't yeah. If I didn't. <laughs> and I saw that your name comes from, you know, being unbreakable and super strong. Yeah. Obviously, we're celebrating International mm -hmm. Women's Day today. Like, how important is that to you? So important. Diamond is a representation of a strong, powerful woman. And so is myself. Um, I am Diamond in essence. So um, being able to share that and inspire young girls, the next generation to be strong and powerful, lift weights, it's it's dream come true. It really yeah, is. and, and, and I, I remember I seeing this earlier. You were I touched upon it as well. Like yeah. you were bullied at school because of your height and those types mm -hmm. of things. So yeah. how did you overcome those types of things? And what do you say to those people now? Uh, look at me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, school was hard. School was hard. It's it was something I was bullied all the way through high, um, primary school and high school. Um, but I feel like it definitely toughened me up and made me want to to show them that I can be strong, I can be powerful, and here I am today. It's, um, it's definitely something that has moulded me, as I will say, I will say 100%. Um, would I have maybe gotten to train if I hadn't been bullied? Um, who knows? But it's um, playing, I played football actually when I was younger. Yeah, I wanted to touch upon that. Age. Something we had in common, I'm yeah. not as fit and strong as you can see, but yeah. something we had in common was yes. that we both played with the boys. And I said, you yeah. know, I loved it. And I think mm -hmm. it actually helped me up until the age yeah. of nine. The rules were then girls had to stop playing with boys when up until they were nine, now it's 12. Yeah. But do you think that helped you a lot, you know, 100%. playing with the boys growing up? Definitely, yeah. I always like hung around the boys more and played with them in school. And I was always, I said, I was really confused when I couldn't play with them anymore in an actual team. Um, but it definitely, again, it was something that I used to go to, to playing football. It was my escape from the bullying um, that, that really helped. And yeah, absolutely loved it. it like growing up playing football, it, it definitely, like you said, it, it moulds you. It's um, like, you obviously, you yourself got bullied as well and stuff. And sort of like we're talking about that people were questioning, why, what are you doing? And I constantly got that as well, like going up through doing bodybuilding as well. There was always a stigma and there still is a stigma in bodybuilding actually with like women being strong, having muscles. Um, so I'm here to show you, you can be strong, powerful, and be feminine at the same time. Absolutely. Um, I think yeah. that deserves a round of applause, yeah. I would say, everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. And how important is it for you? Because now you've been released as this gladiator. <laughs> I know you filmed it last <laughs> June, and it's almost like now you've seen the reaction. Yeah. Like, how important is it for you to use your platform? 
you know, to kind of raise awareness that you can be strong as a woman, as a female. Yeah, I use my platform for that. Anyway, before I was a gladiator, um, I'm an online coach as well. So I train women um, to be stronger, powerful, achieve their goals. Um, so it's what I've been doing as well. But even more so now, I'm just giving out the... Um, putting out there that it is more and more that you can, you can be strong, powerful, um, and using that platform. It's great to be able to use that now. My, it's, it's actually grown, so more and more people are watching that and seeing that, um, and to be able to do that is, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I are people still calling you, diamond, are they calling you diamond in the street or live? Oh, I, get, I get a few looks sometimes and people aren't quite sure, but yeah, I've had a few people like chase me out of the um, petrol station. <laughs> <laughs> diamond, can I have a photo? Um, but no, it's awesome, it's great, but people are going to get to know me as Diamond, but I hope people get to know me as Liv as well, um, because as I said, Di Liv is Diamond and that's who created Diamond there. Amazing, thanks. Thank Round of applause you. for Liv, please. We'll hear more from her later. <laughs> now, Layla, I want to come to you now. You know, can I, Dr. Layla? Are we going to call you Le Dr. Layla's good. Layla's Layla. good. So yeah. I want to reference that because, you know, netball captain and a doctor. And I saw somewhere that you became a doctor based, not based upon Grey's Anatomy in ER, but kind of. <laughs> I, like I saw you, that you're somewhere. You're all too young for Grey's Anatomy. Are you? Anyone Let's seen see. Grey's Anatomy? Yeah. Yeah, I hate <laughs> you people. Yeah, it's not like Grey's Anatomy. But all jokes um, aside, but though, how did you balance, you know, those two things? Because that is incredible. Doctor, captain, netball team, everything. Yeah, I think. The thing about netball, and I don't know how many of you play netball, um, but it's something that we all play at school, uh, but it's not a career that we can live off forever. So we're not footballers, we don't make millions of pounds. Um, and so for so many netballers, there is something else that we have to do on the side anyway. And for me, I just, I always wanted to be a doctor. And I remember my dad saying to me when I was at school, you can do this netball thing, but you're also going to do your academic thing. Um, and I had loads of teachers and netball coaches that were like you know we don't think you can do both of these things and I remember just thinking you know why like you see so many people that do do both things or in every sphere of life there's people that can balance things so why why can't I um and so along the way that it's been challenging at times but it's been so worth it and I just want to say there's for any of you out there I think there's lots of pressure on you guys especially at this age to know what you want to be or mm what academic pathway you want to go into but I don't think it's that important to know I think if there's things that you're passionate about things that you're prepared to work hard at then it all kind of works out in the end and that's how I felt I just was really passionate about both things and wanted to make them work absolutely and I think something that you have to have as well is discipline when you're balancing the two and obviously with your training schedule talk to us a little bit about that training schedule and balancing you know becoming a doctor at the same time yeah I do think you have to be organized and I am not the most organized <laughs> person at all um, but it's, it's making things work. And like Livy said, you know, we train quite hard in netball. I think people often think it's a, a, a girly sport that we wear flowing dresses and we just turn up to play. Um, but we're in the gym a lot, you know, we train, we do weights, we do endurance, we do everything um, that elite athletes across all the sports do. Um, so for me, it's, it's been working that out over the years. So what time I train in between my shifts or what training do I do on that day? Sometimes if I've had 13 hour days, I'm just like, today is not the day to train. I'll do double the session tomorrow. Um, and just knowing myself, knowing my body and trying to make it all work. And I've had a lot of people to help me along the way. I've had a lot of really good netball coaches. I've had some great uh, colleagues that I work with who have helped me, really great teachers when I was at school as well, who helped me to be able to balance my schoolwork and netball. Um, so asking for help and trying to be organised have definitely been important. I don't know if you remember this, my mum and dad always used to say to me, the best time of your life is when you're at school. When I was in it, I used to think, no, now I look back on that and I think life is so much easier mm -hmm. and more simple yeah. during those moments, don't you think? Yeah, I do. I think it's more um, that you don't have all the other responsibilities <laughs> like bills that adulthood <laughs> brings you. Um, and so, yeah, you do... I guess you've got a bit more license to, to be yourself and kind of follow some of the passions that you have. And playing a team sport, how important was that for you? You know, being on a team, working together? Yeah, I love team sport. Um, and I, when I was probably about 13, so maybe a bit younger than some of you guys, um, it was between athletics and netball for me. And I remember on the same day I had an England athletics triple jump trial and I had England netball trials. Uh, and I remember sitting there with the two sheets of paper just being like, oh, they're the same time on the same day. Like, what am I going to do? Uh, but 
I, I loved netball and I just loved that I could play with my friends. Um, I loved that we'd win together, we'd lose together and you'd have that environment. And I've been in the England team for 13 years uh, and I've made some of the best friendships of my whole life from it. And they're the things I think that you really value when you're a bit older. You value the wins, the losses, but you value the good friends that you've made. And I, I love that about team sport and I love that about netball. Amazing. 13 years playing for a that's, round of applause, guys. Come on. Yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. That's incredible. That's incredible. You're not home. <laughs> <from it. laughs> Now, I said today we're going to kind of talk about the good, the bad and the ugly because obviously we sit here and we're kind of talking about all the positive things. But I want us to talk about a little bit, you and I later, about experiences we've had, you know, amongst racism, systematic racism, you know, subconscious, unbiased racism. It exists. And it's something I've had to do with my whole life, my whole career, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have. Is this something you've had to deal with, you know, because I, I stood up for a situation with my national team for a teammate that was, you know, a coach made some comments and... It ended up being on the news, we went to the House of Commons, and in the end, you know, we, we proved that we were telling the truth because we were all along. But then I lost my England career based upon it. So it was quite an extreme situation, but I sleep at night knowing that I did the right thing, you know, and, and I have a clear conscience of doing that. I'm not perfect, but I try to be. Um, is, it, is racism something you've experienced playing or something you've seen? And how do you respond when that's happened to you? Yeah, it's definitely something I've experienced and I've experienced it both in the sporting world and in the medical world, um, and both are really difficult to deal with. Um, I think from a sporting point of view, the kind of worst racism that I experienced was when I went and played in Australia. And in Australia, there's a professional netball league out there, so you know you get paid a lot more than you do here. Um, but Australia has quite a different, I guess, society and demographic to what we have here. And I had another black girl in my team, um, and yeah, regularly people said, incorrect things to us we were mistaken for each other nationally on the news um, and people didn't see anything wrong with it and I remember going into a supermarket out there um, with my whole team um, and I was stopped at the door for them to search my bag and we all had our normal training bags I had my sweaty trainers in there and um, I hadn't stolen anything and I remember putting something on social media, just saying, you know, hey, supermarket, why was I the only one stopped out of a group of 10? Um, and it turned out that that supermarket was a sponsor of the club. And quite quickly, I was asked to remove the post um, because the club didn't want to lose their sponsorship deal. Um, and it was then I, I yeah, realised, as you say, that it, it's hard to be an advocate for racism, but it's really important. Um, and I, I refuse to take down the post because it's, it's my experience and I don't think we're there to just benefit the club and their sponsorship. We're people and we have our own feelings and people should advocate for us as well. Um, and then from a work point of view, I've regularly, well not, I wouldn't say regularly, that's a bit unfair, but I've certainly had people who have not believed that I'm doctor, a doctor when I've gone to treat them. Um, questioned where I'm from or where I'm really from when I say I'm from Birmingham um, and yeah people who haven't wanted me to treat them um, and haven't said why but you can always tell why. I want to touch upon that a little mm. bit because it's a feeling you get isn't it because yeah. some people don't really understand and I think it's a big topic of conversation it's always been there racism has always been there and it always will be unfortunately but I think people like ourselves and everybody can kind of if you do experience it, I would say speak up. But what I will say is a feeling you get in the pit of your stomach, isn't it? Because some people think, oh, you know, that can't be because of the colour of your skin. That can't be because of your sexuality. That can't be because you're a woman. And you're like, you just know it. But sometimes it's hard to vocalise those things because then you're perceived as like a troublemaker. Yeah. But it is a feeling that you get, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's hard sometimes when it's the, the I guess we call it microaggressions now, but the things that aren't really blatant. So if someone says something really awful and racist to you, then we all know that that's racist. But when, like you say, it's the feeling in your stomach, it's really hard to, to tell other people what that feeling feels like. Um, and sometimes you don't know in your mind and you're like, oh, am I just reading too much into this? Maybe I should just leave it. But then actually, no, this really isn't right. But I, I don't, you don't always know what to do about it. Yeah, well, I think you're amazing. So give it up for Layla. We'll come back to you in a minute. Dr. Layla. <laughs> now, Steph leads me on to say the best to last, some what might say. I want to ask you about, you know, the statistics show that it's twice as likely for a young girl to drop out of sports as opposed to young boys growing up. Why do you think that is? Well, it's a bit heavier, isn't it? I was just going to say I'm, a I'm starstruck. Oh, um, yeah. Being next to Layla. 
Um, yes, yeah, so we are, we're, we're a small charity and we do a lot of research and we talk to little boys, we talk to little girls about sport a lot. In fact, slightly sort of bizarrely so much, we spend like all our lives talking to girls and women about sport. And we've just been doing research because we all know as girls growing up that boys can be pretty horrible to us at times um, when it comes to sport in the playground, whatever. It's like they, you get a sense they feel they own it. Um, and so we've been looking into what parents say to their kids, what teachers are, so some teachers in the room, so got to be careful, what teachers you know, are actually doing in, in the playground in the sport and, and how coaches are behaving towards girls versus boys to just sort of work out the difference. Um, and you'd think with what's been going on on our screens recently with the lionesses, with, you know, with the netball being finally allowed to be on our screens. I mean, talking about dreaming growing up, I love netball, it was my sport. Um, you couldn't ever see it on telly. I wept last year when I saw my daughter, who also loved netball, watching it on telly for the first time, screaming at the telly. And her boyfriend was going, what's going wrong with her? She's gone mad. I said, it's her sport. She's 25. It's the first time she's seen it on telly. So... Where did I go? Where did I go? I completely get that. Where was we I going, going before I started talking We were going about on about statistics and young girls dropping out as opposed to the okay, boys. Okay, go back to that. <laughs> yes, so, um, so we do this research. We ask people about stuff. And what we found out, oh, that's what it was. Um, so I see I'm the oldest on this panel, so I'm going to lose my way occasionally. Um, but we found out that despite all of this uh, televised coverage now, it's still only a pathetic amount compared to the men, but it's there. Um, we are finding that parents think that their girls' um, priority is to look good, to be careful. That's the thing that parents say much more to girls than boys, even when they're two. They would say, be careful more. Um, and the boys are there to be wild boys and play and be outside, or as we're sort of told, we've got to be careful, stay neat, matters more what we look like. And, and actually, we all grow out there. We don't realise what it's doing. But if someone says to you, be careful, when you really didn't need to be, you are instilled with a sense of fear and you don't understand where it's coming from. And so you grow up being slightly more afraid. You're not even sure what of, because your parents have said, be careful so much when you're tiny, you know, far more than your brother. Um, and so, and then we're put off sport because they're basically, boys who are rubbish at sport, I feel really sorry for them, because boys are basically told your life is worthless without being good at sport. There's so much pressure put on boys to be good at sport. And then you land these two little kids in the playground, you know, you were about 13, whatever. so eight years ago when you started school, you get these boys landing in the playground, boys, girls landing in the playground. The boys have been, you know, their parents have been training them up for that moment for the, you know, since they were born, so that they can prove how great they are in the, in the, and they're better, they actually have more skills. This is the thing, by then they on average have more skills because they've been trained up. The girls land without very many skills and then they're put together and the boys kick us off the playground so they can play football better. I still feel that way when I go into a gym now. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but you know, when you go into a gym, you know, the weights are at the back of the thing and you're like, I still want to go over there. You know, I've played in World Cups, I've played for England, but I still feel, so I can't imagine it's not how really much... your place, is it? No, That's because the they're like slamming down really weights and I'm like, yeah. I feel inadequate. But it's like, imagine someone like myself who's pretty confident. It'd be quite difficult for, for you know, young girls and females that are not as confident going into those spaces, wouldn't yeah. it? So by the time, basically, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but I mean, the Keep fact going. is, yeah. the fact <laughs> is that we are brought up to think that men own sport, that men own it, that it's their thing. And actually what sport is all about is fun. So isn't that a bit rubbish that we're taught to say men have fun, we do the housework. Well, that's not great. So um, we're kind of pushing back against that and saying sport can be fun if we're just allowed to do it our way and we're allowed to do the sports we want to do. And, and then you can actually draw and you talk about teamwork amazing life skills from sport amazing and you know obviously being able to swim is a fundamental feeling strong but playing in a team you actually learn what you need in in an office you know in a team environment when you're at work because you learn all sorts of things like if you mess up and how people are going to treat you and how to look after people who mess up or that sort of sense of of communication between each other to make sure you can do the, the job better so masses of life skills that you learn what? We've got to we've got to shift this, and we've got to stop basically stereotyping, which is what I'm talking about. Do you see any improvements at all? Like, do you think it's got better because you touched upon your daughter watching the netball? So it's an it's an improvement, isn't it? I still think we have a long way to yeah, go. Yeah, no, there is. But at least we can kind of see and believe it. Yeah, sorry, we've got to be a bit positive. There is no, 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 no. So uh, no, there is an improvement. <laughs> so we did we did a big survey before the uh, lionesses won the Euros, and we did a big survey after. We asked uh, actually people of your age, but age thirteen to twenty four boys and girls, whether they dreamt of reaching the top of sport. 
And the first one we did, 60% uh, of boys dreamt of reaching the top of sport and 30% of girls dreamt of reaching the top of sport. So a massive team, uh, dream deficit. And then we did it again after the years. We thought, well, that will have changed. And it hadn't changed that much, except that that proportion of girls who were already playing loads of sport, their dream rates had gone through the roof. So the girls who were playing sport could suddenly dream, and it went up from 50% of those to 69% of them, which is massive. Anyone who's into stats, that's a massive change. So suddenly, girls like we would have been at school could dream, which we weren't really allowed to do. Yeah. Um, so that has been massive. But what we've got to do is to get to a position where, on average, in this room, only one in five of you would have been those girls who love sport. And we've got to get to a position where many more girls have the opportunity to actually experience it you know, we should be allowed to go to school in clothes we can actually run around in. We should be allowed to um, choose the sports we want to play. We should sometimes get to play without the boys there, so we're not teased all the time. And if we're chucked into a mixed group to play, the teachers need to understand that that won't always work out. It's really tough because we usually chuck, chucked into mixed groups to play, particularly in primary school. But we need to actually understand what the experiences girls are going through. And I think fundamentally, we as adults need to understand why it matters to their lives. What more do you think schools can do to encourage girls? So I went to an all-girls school, right? And this is something, me and my best friend were the only ones that ever wanted to do PE. And I know that's still reality now because, you know, I have a niece and those types of things and they want letters from... The reality is kids want letters from their parents because they don't want to do PE mm -hmm. most of the time because they feel embarrassed because they're around boys and those types of things. So what more do you think schools can do to encourage girls to kind of, because me and my best friend used to just play badminton. I mean, it's a fantastic sport, but there's only so much you can do with two people because all the other girls were like, I've got blisters or, you know, making excuses because they felt embarrassed. And I get it as well. Yeah. Well, we're not born self-conscious. It's a funny, it's a funny thing, you know. Yeah. We're not, like, we don't, we're not born and then, you know, oh, hi, mum, oh, I'm feeling really self-conscious. It's, it's kind of totally put into us by people telling us it matters so much what we look like but what can schools go I mean there are some we know that if you if girls go to school in sports kit they will play all through break whereas if we're going to school in shoes that don't give support we can't run around in in skirts etc we won't so school, school uniform is important the length of PE lessons matters because what we hear from girls I don't know if this is your experience is you don't have time to sort of how to wash you know get ready again for classes after PE and probably, you know, the school uh, facilities might not be that nice a place either to do that, and there may not be enough privacy. So there's some practical things around that. We also have this really pleasant challenge as women of going through having our periods and needing sports bras. And nobody really helps that much with that. So, you know, we're left to struggle with what is actually a massive change that our body is going through. And it's just not normalised to talk about it. But actually, 70% of girls will avoid sport in their period, including the girls who play loads of sport. Doesn't matter, you might be well into sport, but you're trying to avoid it. And 14% of schools um, have sports bras on their PE kit list. And they're expensive, but the fact is, it really hurts, you know, running around. I mean, I'm quite flat chested, right? So it's not so bad for me, but even for me, it's really uncomfortable and it completely puts girls off playing. So there are some really practical things that we can do that would help girls a lot. Um, some of them are challenging in terms of the length of lessons. You can't really change that easily. But if you value, after school clubs, very few after school clubs have sport for girls. Thank you, Stephanie. Honestly, just it, this is what's so good about round of applause. Round of applause, yeah, yeah. Round of applause please. Everybody. Thank you. I think. I think what's so good about the panel we have and the discussions we're having is that it's open and honest conversations and talking about the reality because we could all sit up here and kind of sugarcoat the reality, but we're all here, you know. So I think we can, one person, everybody today can maybe relate to someone upon this panel. And something you just touched upon there that I want to ask everybody, kit is a big topic of conversation of late, right? So obviously I play football. The ACL injury is literally a pandemic. I say it all the time. There's been six players they've done their ACO in the last 10 days. Now, I'm not saying that's due to the fact that it's kit specifically, that's the reason. I think it's overload. But what was your experience like, Ellie, of, you know, kit within your, your industry growing up? And I want to ask everybody the same question as well. Come to you first. Yeah, no, very much so. I know swimming. Um, you're in a swimming costume, aren't you? Um, I don't know, do you do swimming at school here with you guys? No. We used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we used to as well. Um, but I think for swimming, it's quite a, yeah intrusive with swimming costumes and things like that. So I think that that's what we have to wear 
um, unfortunately. But I think, again, talking about periods and stuff like that, I think what more could be done is talking about it and education and not being like, I know when I go and get like my tampons and things like that, I always find it really nerve wracking. And I don't know why, but it's something maybe we're inbuilt to be like, this is quite a yeah like why do why why are we trying to hide being on a period because we all have periods can i just say something that that i love about news uk they're all free in the bathrooms and i think that should be something Mm, that's everywhere something so simple because we all know how that feels when it happens and you're like what do i do and the fact that they have it available here hopefully we'll start to see you know everywhere having them yeah and i think that's amazing and i think for me i had a very very good relationship with my coach um he's like my second dad and he's my best friend and he was my coach from 12 years old till when i retired when i was 26 27 and we had that relationship where we could talk about oh when i'm on, I'm on my period i'm not feeling that good today i'm very emotional um i'm not feeling good about my body all that type of stuff and we were, I was very lucky that I had that with him and I think it's really important that we just talk about it more, talk about periods in sport, talk about our body shapes, all that type of thing. But I think, yeah, just the education, but talking about it is is the most important thing to do. Yeah, I agree. And Diamond, I want to come to you. Yeah. A kit within the industry, you know, I, I, I touched upon it, you know, most of the kit is when I was growing up, mostly mm-hmm. specifically hand-me-downs for the men's team. Yeah. Are we seeing times changing? Uh Maybe a little bit. Um, I'm going to a, my local team, actually, and I tried to wear their shirts and a medium was tiny for me, so I think they are sort of... I wish I had that same be. problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, so I think they are... Uh, I think now the, the kit is getting more shapeful for women and stuff like that, which is amazing. But um, I think there is still, like, moving more into, like, the gym sort of area, there's so much out there now, which is incredible. Um to be able to wear and stuff like that. But again, it's about the support in the gym as well and what to wear, how you feel in it. And that's a whole other story. And like fashion in the gym as well, you can, especially as girls, we can feel very pressured to buy the latest like here and the brands and all that sort of stuff. So keeping up with that is A, an expense, B, what are all your friends wearing? Um, That can be quite intense as well. Um, well, where were we going with this? Oh, no, no, you're absolutely <laughs> perfectly. I'll come to yeah. later. That was um, great. So, yeah, it's, um, it can be a lot. Um, so, obviously, if you girls are going to the gym uh, and training and stuff like that, wearing what you feel comfortable in. If you want to wear shorts one day, even on your periods, that's absolutely fine. I know there are a lot of girls out there who won't wear shorts because they're on their periods or how they're feeling, um, or you'll wear a baggy top. But just go there and be you um, and, and wear what you want to wear. Don't feel self-conscious. You're there to work on yourself. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And Leila, obviously, playing netball, did you have similar experiences to myself, having kit not really available and, you know, you have to get the men's kit? Yeah. we Obviously not in netball, it's not, more yeah. female specific. But. Yeah. We, I've, I've got many, many stories about kit. Um, I think, you know, netball is known for short, tight dresses. Um, and not everyone wants to wear a short, tight dress to play. Um, and we've had loads of chats in netball over the last couple of years. We've seen hockey, England hockey have gone towards wearing shorts and not just skirts. Um, and there's certainly, like, I hope in the next kind of five years, we'll see that netballers can play in shorts and people can play in things that they're a lot more comfortable with. Because I do know that we've done research and that really um, disincentivizes girls from playing because they think they have to wear the short, tight outfits that we play in. Um, And so we want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. Um, I think, you know, we've had things like where we've been pressured to wear white shorts and we've said people are on their periods, we can't wear white shorts. Um, And speaking about periods, at the Commonwealth Games a couple of years ago, we were in a really tight bubble. And it so happened everybody went on their period at exactly the same time, just went all out of sync. And we really struggled to get tampons into the village because oh, there were security what? checks and we were ordering them off Amazon and just trying to get hold of them. And it, it's a distraction that you don't really want when you're in the middle of a Commonwealth Games, which is kind of the pinnacle for netball. Um, and so they are things that as women, you have to really think about when you're packing your kit bag, you're thinking about your periods and you're thinking about what you need, where the men's games across all sports don't have that. So. Yeah, yeah, kit periods, really important conversations. And I know a lot of sports, football and netball, are talking a lot about sports bras and how important that is and how periods can affect your training and can affect 
um, like your competition. And so, yeah, I do hope kind of in your generations, there'll be so much more information for you all. Yeah, I'm glad that when I retired five years ago, the Lionesses and all of the WSL, they don't wear white shorts anymore. Yeah. And I, that's something so small and to other people might not get that. But for me, that I wish it was a reality when I was there. Stephanie, I want to come to you for my last question. You know, this week has been a lot of conversation about how there's not really a women's specific football boot available. You know, there's only two companies. Like, talk to me a little bit about that and why that's the reality, why a young girl can't go into a shop and buy a football boot specific to her. Yes. Well, I mean, who watched what happened with Mary Ertz's shirt in the build-up to the World Cup? Were people aware of that? People engaged? How many people watched the Women's World Cup? Not all of you. See, people as old as me, it's like having women's team sport on telly. Even if you weren't in the mood to watch it, you watch it because it's such a breakthrough. But Marriott's absolutely amazing goalkeeper. Best uh, in the world. Best Two in times the world, in a row. Yeah. And uh, the kit providers that were making the kit decided not to make a shirt with her name on it. So nobody could buy it. So there was a huge, big thing about that. And I mean, I guess that the bottom line is that And then when they made it ver- the- available, it sold out in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah of course it did. Of course it <laughs> is. You know, Arsenal filling <laughs> stadiums now regularly. Um, I mean, you know, the Emirates regularly. I mean, the thing is that the world is run by men. And, you know, most men I meet are, are really good men. But it's just run by men. So, you know, there are people who haven't thought about the things that when you grow up as a woman, you think about. And so, you know, I, I had a colleague who used to work on making, we're talking a lot about periods today, make sanitary, you know, was involved in Unilever when they're making all the sanitary products, and they were all men making them. And she was sitting around a room with like 15 blokes, and they said, actually, you know, they were making the sanitary products. What's it like being on your period? And it's like, oh, my God, you're making sanitary products. So it's not that surprising that in every single field you look at, design is not designed around women. And, you know, we know that seat belts were designed for 11 stone men which meant that women get injured more in car crashes. We know that, you know, anything, like even those Fitbit watches were designed for a male wrist, which is a lot bigger and broader. So that every woman I knew had one was going, really loose though, and that's because of that. I can't really open many screw top bottles because I've got particularly weak grip. But they were designed by men. They're probably sitting in the factory going, that's about the right strength for opening. Because I'll tell you this, top female athletes have um, grip strength equivalent to some of the weaker men. So 75% of men have got a stronger grip strength, average men, than a top female act. That's the difference. So I'm not, it's not that surprising that football boots have followed, especially since they banned us from football because we were far too good at it in the 1920s. <laughs> um, so it's not that surprising that football boots have been designed around the male foot, which is different. And the way we put weight through our legs and the way our, because of our hips being slightly broad and the way our legs work, we have pressure points in our feet that are different to men. So actually we need different boots to men. And if we don't have the right boot, it will contribute towards injuries and other things. So it's just that speed of change. Uh, well, it's not speedy. The change is too slow. Yeah. And it, and it needs, and the world is sort of run by multinationals that are huge. So what you see is small startups are filling the gap and making these things, but they end up being expensive. So they're not for everyone. Yeah. So, but it is changing now. I mean, these conversations weren't even happening five, ten years ago. Exactly. So I think you know we are at that moment of change, and that is exciting. Yeah, amazing. I, that was a question that came to me actually while I was in it. So I'm glad yeah. I asked it. We're not done yet, guys. We'll give <laughs> give up to my amazing panel for now. <laughs> they, they, they shared some amazing, honestly, some input and like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now we're going to come to the floor. Remember, I mentioned before don't be shy the microphone will come to you and you can ask anybody a question you can ask an individual you can ask a question to the group anything you want to ask right now put your hand up and the microphone will come to you don't start dming me on instagram later (laughs) sending me your questions for today because i won't answer them i'm only joking i have a question for everyone can we stand up so we can see you please thank you who was it when emma was a little kid the boys think that just because they're boys, they think they're better than everybody else. Who thinks that? <laughs> I don't think that goes When away. I was little, <laughs> yeah, no. I wanted to be many different things. A footballer, a hairdresser, scientist, but the boys said, I can't be that because I'm a girl. But I'm going to prove the boys wrong when I'm older. I'm going to be what I want to be when I'm yeah. older. That's right. <laughs> I love that. That's what we're talking about. 
Thank you for that. Yeah. It takes a lot of strength to get up and say that in a room full of people. Yeah, well, well done. done. Yeah, yeah, you star. You just You'll be on it. here next year. And, uh, <laughs> treat it as the inspiration that you are for doing it. If someone says you can't do it, do it. Absolutely. Anyone else got any questions? I'm sure your teachers are thinking yeah. about school. There's some, there's Hello. Over here. Sorry, I'm just hopping in as well. I just wonder what was the most inspirational thing you've been told in your career and who told it to you? And that's for everyone. Okay, I, I'll answer it first. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we, we touch upon a lot where we're like, someone tell us we can't do something. I think the best bit of information I got was probably from coaches where they just kind of make it specific to me. I think in a team sport, people generalise and say, well, you do this, do you do that? But my dad was is somebody that, best bit of advice I got when I was playing for Arsenal was that I kept taking a touch. How many of you are football fans in this room? So you know what I'm talking about. I won't get too much terminology. But like he said to me, darling, you know, when you're in the box, you know, like, you know, Harry Kane, just hit it in first touch, finish. I'm like, all right, dad. And then I scored 15 more goals that season. So it's like, but the way my dad communicated that to me, darling, you know, when you're in, it wasn't, I get in the car and he'd have a go at me because I was still scoring a lot of goals. But it's, the, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So I feel like for me, when I've had coaches and we can say teachers, I've had some teachers that I still think about now that were so helpful to me from the age of like seven. And there's some that I remember because they were mean. And that's the reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think like exactly like you. And I think those personal individuals make such a difference, isn't it? And it's like you mentioned, it's the way that it's said, but also the careness, like how they care about you is just, yeah, makes a, makes a massive difference. But I think for me, like, Going back to, to the individual that made a massive, massive difference to, to my life um, and my career was my coach, um, Billy Pye. He always made sure that well, how I was as a swimmer, um, he always used to say a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. So for me, he, what he did was made sure that my life outside the water was just as important as my life in the water. So say if I like, um, needed to go to sea a family member, he would like happily say, yeah, go to that because that was made me happy. So that translated then into the water. So it's really important to, to balance life. Yes, it's about um, focusing on your sport or focusing on your career, but it's really important that you balance life outside of that and make sure you have times for, for yourself, for your friends, for your family. And yeah, it's really important that that whole balance is really affects you personally. Yeah, I completely agree. I want to touch on like how, like you said, people talk to you and how they give you advice. Um, being bullied, going back to that, I very much had a quick sort of, I always felt that some people were just attacking me all the time. So when someone would try to give me advice or give me constructive criticism, I always took it, took it as an attack and I would just wouldn't listen. I'd just go off and do my own thing. Um, but there were people there who would approach the subjects uh, in a way that I could understand and were very supportive and those people in, in life are so, so, so important. And I'm meeting even more of those people now in my adult life um, from my younger years. And um, yeah, I think going back to the actual question, um, I very much recently and growing up always got told to be myself. My confidence really suffered when I was younger. Um, but when as I start to grow up and, and let myself be more myself and be more unique and show off the great attributes that I have, um, that's where I really start to blossom and people start to notice. And there we are, yeah. And you, Leila? Um, I think for me, well, the person who said this to me was a netball coach that I've known for years and years since I, well, probably since I was about 15. Um, and I'd reached a bit of a stage in my career where I just wanted the next thing. And so I'd win something and then I'd want to win something else. So I'd want to get an award and I'd, I'd just want to keep getting things. Um, and one time she just said to me, just like, slow down and just in, enjoy this process. And I think everyone here is so competitive, as many of you probably will be, and perfectionists and want to just keep hitting different accolades. And she, she just said to me to enjoy it and make some memories. <coughs> Um, and yeah, I think I found that really valuable because I think when I look back on the things I've done, I don't remember each individual win or whatever it was. I remember the process, the great memories, the crazy photos I have of things, along with the medals, which are really nice, but the process and the journey is really important and shouldn't be forgotten about. And you, Stephanie? 
I really relate to what you said, actually, about I, I was really rubbish at taking any feedback or advice when I was young. And you have to bear in mind that a lot of people give feedback and advice you don't want, and they're often wrong. So I think, you know, the, the, the reality is if you really admire somebody, it's worth asking them for any feedback, because then if you really admire them, it's for a reason, and they might actually understand you. So the most important thing is that the person who's giving you that advice or feedback is that he loves you and understands you, because otherwise it's not normally helpful. So I can think of a few. If I, my netball coach at school was the person who made me into almost partly who I am, because if you were being thrashed, she'd be at the side going, go on like that. So you've got this mentality of never giving up. And she also gave that specific type of feedback to each member of the team. So in some ways, I found, actually, I found, like, I'm in my 50s, I found a card she'd written for the team um, when we were 16, and it went through everyone. It said, you've got the spring, you've got this, you've got that, and it came to me, and you, you've got the brain. <laughs> I rubbish, really, at, at being physical. You've got the brain, and you've got the communication skills, and you can direct them from the back. And it's, like, specific stuff. It's That's important stuff. as well, though. Yeah, it is. And, and belief, and I think, um, I always thought I was rubbish at, at chemistry, okay? Who cares? I to bet. A lot of people in the but I thought it was rubbish. When I had to do the A level because of what I wanted to do, and uh, and I thought it was going to be tough. And I got a new teacher, and she just said to me after I got like an E, which I don't know what that would translate into now, but it's not good. She said, "What do you want to get in your A level?" And I said in a sort of slightly bratish way, I said an A. And rather than saying, "Well, you're not going to get that," she said, "Well, you better do some work then." And that was the first time I worked out you had to work to do well. I mean, it's I'm not presenting myself as terribly sort of intelligent, but. <laughs> Um, but it was that belief in me that I could do it if I worked. And it was the first time someone had really made me feel that. So it's really, I think, just filtering what comes your way and, and just making sure that you listen to the wisest people who love you the most. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Anyone else got any questions? Thank you for that. Oh, We're right. only going to have to do a couple oh, more. There, there was we can definitely yeah. 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 Less we can be all day. Yeah. I'm more sure questions, less of us. Yeah. Um, this question is for all of you, and um, what struggles did you face being a female athlete, and how did you deal with it? Steph, do you want to take that one first, or start from your end first? Yeah, because I wasn't really much of an athlete until after, well, I was at school, I was at school, and, uh, and I think the worst thing was getting injured. Um, so I, all I did was sport at school, and it's all I loved, but I hurt my back playing badminton, actually, when I was like 17, and I really, really got depressed, so I think it's just, I only got over that by diverting and doing more swimming, and then... But actually, the thing I should have done now is take more advice on how to get over it. So I think injury is a big one. Yeah, I, I would have said injuries as well. And I, when I look through my career, that's definitely been the most challenging parts that I've had. Um, and I, I've ruptured my, I've had many injuries and operations. Um, but the worst I had was rupturing my Achilles in the second game of a World Cup. Um, something that I'd worked so hard for and then just pop in a few minutes into a game. Um, and I, I always think you don't know who you are as an athlete until you've had to rehab an injury because you just learn so much about yourself and the, like, the resilience and the challenge that's needed. And it's easy to be happy, it's easy to keep going when things are going well, but when things are really tough, that's when I think you learn a lot about yourself. So And I other think, people, I think, as well. Yeah. Like, like When you're injured, it's like you realise the people that are really there for you as well. Yeah. That's what I learned as well. Yeah, and so it's, it's a tough time, but I also think that they built me and shaped me into a more resilient person as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I haven't done any like... Um, You're on gladiators, after, come, oh, on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, so I, I spoke going back to like the bodybuilding and um, with that, you can constantly get injured. So you have to be, constantly make sure you're stretching, but you know, we all don't do enough of that really, do we? So. Um, yeah, I, re I have rehabbed from a few of it recently. I actually had a really bad back injury where I couldn't actually walk, <laughs> which took me a few weeks to get over. But I think the resilience of wanting to get over that injury and um, come back even stronger is what keeps you going and striving and gets you, keeps you pushing. Um, but especially with gladiators, on the run up to that, everyone around me was just wrapping me in, um, uh, in bubble wrap. And <laughs> I, want, I, want, I wanted to go, I wanted to go skiing. And they were like, no. <laughs> I saw one of the contestants a couple of weeks ago actually got injured and they had yeah. to replace them. And I was like, how gutted yeah. would you be if you were like 100%. your biggest moment and you pick up an injury? Mm. So yeah. yeah, yeah. There was it's a lot of that. At the end of the day, it's um it is you are in there doing the games. It's not fake. Um yes, there's a bit of pantomime and stuff, but it's it's not fake at all. You're there doing it and it just goes to show you can get injured. Um but everyone's incredible and yeah, shout out to um the gladiators because the physios we had were, were amazing and kept us all going and 
yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of us that needed a lot of stuff, but it was it was good. Yeah. Thanks for that, Diamond. Ellie, you? Yeah, so I've been so so lucky uh, throughout my career. I'm not being really, really being injured. So um, maybe I know a lot of swimmers get shoulder issues and things, shoulder problems. But yeah. So far, touch wood, I know I'm not an athlete anymore, I haven't been injured, but I think for me, my biggest challenge actually was when I was younger, um, so like I said previously, I swam at an, a non-disabled swimming club, and as I was getting older and older, um, the distance between myself and my non-disabled peers was getting greater, so actually... Um, the other swimmers used to get up every level. So do you know when you swim, you can get your, like, your 10 metre badge, your 20 metre badge, your 100 metre badge, all that type of stuff. And I got left in like the junior group because I couldn't swim as fast as um, my age. So I remember being so upset and like I, I strong word, but I hated my um, coach at the time because she she left me and I was with all like the eight, eight, nine year olds and I was like 12 and swimming with them and it was so embarrassing and all that type of stuff. But actually, I looked back and it actually made me stronger. It actually made me train harder because I wanted to be with my, my friends and my peers and eventually I swam stronger and I swam more and more. I worked harder and I... Um, Got selected then to go into the next level but I think for me it was definitely like that where I see my peers and people who are a lot taller than me be able to achieve things and I was left with the kids I found that really really tough but um for me it, like now I look back and I think it made me the athlete that I am today because I knew what hard work was all about because I I needed to work hard from a young young age to be the same as my peers yeah. So, yeah, I think if I didn't have, have that opportunity to work harder, um, I probably wouldn't have gone to Beijing at, in 2008 and achieved what I did in London 2012 because, yeah, it made me work harder at a younger age. Amazing. Thank you all for sharing that. I'm not going to share mine. I want to get for, through some more questions with you all. Um, this question's for Leila, and I was just wondering, when your teachers and coaches said that you couldn't juggle being a doctor and playing netball at the same time, how did you manage your time? Yeah, it was, yeah, good question. Um, I think I had a good balance, so I'm not saying everyone told me that I couldn't do it. I certainly, my family really supported it, and I had some teachers and some coaches that did. Um, I remember having one coach who sat me down, and I'd started uni at this stage, and she was like, you need to drop out. I found you a place at Bath Uni, which was where all the netball was happening. And she was like, you won't make it to England if you carry on doing medicine, where I was... Um, and I guess for me, it was the support network that I'm talking about. So it was, you have those people in your ear, but I had so many people championing me. And my dad was massive in being like, you can do this, like, why can't you? And supporting me, helping me to work out how to juggle it all. I had a really good club coach at the time that would sit down with me when I'd have my semester at uni and say, right, you can do this training here, you can do this here. And this match will be here and, and really helped me to just balance it all out. So I, I've had so many people supporting me that I, I definitely wouldn't have become a netballer or a doctor without them at all. Great question. I love your reaction after you asked that. You were like, well done. <laughs> well done for standing yeah. up and asking. Anyone else? This is great, everyone, by the yeah, way. Yeah, the questions yeah. at the front here. I'm really, really impressed by everybody. Oh, Hold on, I think we're going two oh, mics so. at once. We do a <laughs> yeah. duet, like the voice. Well, I'd just like to say, we're all from, most of us in the room are from South East London and we don't really have the option to play football or play sports and because of you guys and Mary Earps and Anne Scott, we have this option, I just want to say thank you and also the question is, Messi or Ronaldo? <laughs> Messi. Ronaldo. Oh, Messi. Oh. Messi, yeah. <sighs> Ronaldo. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I'm not into football. <laughs> Messi, I think we were split. Mm -hmm. um, who were your role models growing up? And if you didn't, who inspired, like, how were you inspired to become where you are today? I think for me, my role models growing up was David Beckham. And this goes back to, like, visibility of not really being able to see female football on the television, really. And I think, you know, my parents were massive in... I used to think, when I look back on this, I used to think my parents were supposed to do that. And I look back and I'm like, when I was seven years old, they were driving me all the way from South East London, big up South East London, from Lewisham 
to Watford for literally a 14 minute game, seven minutes each way, because we could only play seven aside. Never complain, just get back in the car afterwards and then get a happy meal on the way home. And then that, the rest is history. <laughs> now I look back on that and I'm like, that's actually amazing that they used to do that. But we all have to have somebody that kind of supports us. It doesn't have to be a mum or a dad. It can be a guardian, it can be an aunt, it can be an uncle. And I think that that for me was just so impactful to have that type of support from my family. Yeah, parents definitely play a big part. Um, like itself, um, my parents, and especially my mum, used to get up. Swimming is not, um, it's a very early morning sport. I was just about to say that, yeah. like, getting in the water when it's absolutely freezing, like, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how I did it either. I think, again, teammates make it um, play a massive, massive part. Um, yes, swimming is a very much an individual sport, but, but when you've got your teammates, who you're having a bit of banter, having a laugh, and like sometimes they push you in, like in a good push, like a good way. I never um, think that's a good push. I don't find that funny, so <laughs> do never do that to me. Yeah, I'll know now, next time. Um, but yeah, d uh, parents definitely play a big, big part. My mom was delighted when I passed my driving test I think when I was 17, just before London 2012, because she didn't have to set the alarm anymore. It was my responsibility. So yeah, parents definitely play a big part. And for me, though, it was um, a lady called Nairi Lewis, who's a Paralympic swimmer, um, watching her as a 10-year-old get the gold medal in the Athens 2004 Paralympics, my first time seeing Paralympic and disability sport on TV, and sitting and seeing her get a gold medal, watching that race, I was like, someone like me on TV, there's someone that's yeah, the Paralympics, and I was like, I want to get a gold medal, I want to go to the Paralympics, and that was when my dream started. So I think, again, representation and disability and seeing people like yourself on TV is so, so important because you never know who you're going to inspire, and I think it's really important. Yes, we've got the Paralympics this year, but it's really important that we've got disability is on TV more and more. It shouldn't just be every four years that the Paralympics is on. It should be we have world championships, we have... Europeans, we have World Series, it's really important that they sh TV and the power of TV and newspapers and all that type of stuff show disability sport more and more because I think anyone could become disabled, um, a person could get injured tonight and have a disability so it can affect any single person so I think it's really important that yeah and what, again, with uh, TV, plays a massive, massive part. And like Strictly Come Dancing, and you see CBBCs, ha people now have more and more disability presenters. They like to call the midwife. Line of Duty have had an individual with Down syndrome on, on the show. It's really, really important that more and more people now see. And again, it's, it's, it's for education too. So you grow up later on in life and you are aware that there's so many disabilities out there. Yeah, I want to come to you first. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open up another question and then I'll come directly to oh, you. I'm sorry, I did my, No, I no, 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 it was long. me. I talked too much. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. I speak a lot too. No, it's good. It's a good thing. Yeah, at the front. Um, so this is for everyone. Um, what advice would you give to the NGO women into the world of sports has opened up opportunities for other women? That one allows what, what was the, what was the, sorry, what was it again? I missed the yeah. first bit. Yeah. The entry of women into the world of sports has it opened entry. up opportunities for other women? The entry yeah, the of entry. women into the world yeah, of sports. Yeah, the entry of women. Um, hundred percent. Obviously, there's more and more women. Um, like women's sport is being so much more like broadcast and everything. As we know, it's it's fantastic. It's amazing. Um, but from my bodybuilding background, um, female bodybuilders, there are so many more of them now, and more females in the gym. Um, which is amazing to see. So I think, and social media also, I think that plays a, a huge part of us regularly on the daily seeing women in the gym, training, training to be strong, not just training to, be, to look good, but to actually be physically stronger and physically fitter. I think that holds a huge, um, a huge impact on in influence. So yeah, definitely. Great question, great answer. We'll come to another question and we'll come to you, Leila. Um, I'm sure everyone has a hard time to achieve their dreams. So my question is, have you ever thought of giving up when you have a hard time achieving your dreams or when someone discourages you about your dream? Have you thought about giving up or when some yeah. people have discouraged you within your dream? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about giving up many, many, many times. Um, not necessarily when people have discouraged me. I think similar to what we said earlier, actually when people tell me no, I often think, 
actually, if you're telling me no, I want to be able to do it. So um, that often makes me more defiant with things. But I've certainly had moments where I've not enjoyed sport or I've not, yeah, felt like I was giving my all to something and then felt that, that I've wanted to step away or stop. Or certainly after the injury I was talking about, I thought rehabbing that, I ended up rehabbing that in the middle of the pandemic on a car park in Birmingham for large majorities of it. And I just thought, why am I doing this? I could literally just be sat at home watching TV. Um, but I think for most of those moments, I think when you gain the perspective of why you do the sport and you can lose that sometimes, but when you think about whether it's the competition that you enjoy, just the love of the game, being around your teammates, whatever it is that drives you in the sport is what kind of have kept me going over the last few years. So I would definitely be lying if I'd say that there hadn't been moments, but having the time to think about why I do it has always kept me in it. Thank you for your question. Great answer. We'll come down at the front here. Stephanie, you can answer this one. Um, with being women in sport, have you ever found it hard, um, like at the beginning of your career, to find respect with, um, from others? To do what from others? Respect. 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 Be respect. Being a woman within the industry that you're in. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And um, I, think, I think a lot of other women... I think it's really interesting because I think men generally like sport more. And so actually then they kind of respect you for liking sport because you're liking sport. Whereas a lot of your girlfriends might not like sport more. So they think you're a bit weird liking sport. So where the respect comes from is quite, is quite different. But I think if you respect yourself, then you kind of, and it's, you know, sometimes that can feel challenging. Then you can kind of throw stuff off that lands that's negative. Um, but I, you know, I talk about parents. My parents, my dad just didn't, he just was so good. I mean, he never said anything much, but he just made sure I felt I was equal to my brothers in everything. Um, but they didn't notice I was any good at sport. Like I was the school sports captain. I, they were not driving me around everywhere. They just didn't value sport particularly, um, but I just carried on anyway. But what I did get was just the sort of respect. You can be who you are. Um, so I think that thing was respect. It's a really good question, a bit hard to answer pers on a personal level. I'll come to you. Um, do you know what? I forgot the question. So well, sorry. Navigating the sport as, as a female, you know, navigating the sport that you're in, was it difficult mm -hmm. to do that? I think you touched upon it earlier, really, mm -hmm. you know, having to kind of swim with the junior levels and those yeah, types yeah, of things. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think even now, like, since I, w I had an, um, an experience uh, last week, actually, so uh, I retired after Tokyo in um, 2021, and I had a bit of a break from swimming. But I've started getting back in the water probably once a week because for me, it's helping me not just physically, but also mentally. And I went swimming in, I swim in now in the public sessions. I had a, a thing the, uh, last week where, um, so I try and go in um, a fast lane just because, yeah, my speed you're and fast. stuff. Because yeah. um, you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> but I had it where a man, there was two men in the lane and it was all the, all the other lanes were really packed, busy. So I thought, anyway, I'll go into that lane. And they spread themselves out. Um, and they, I said, oh, can I come in this lane? And they're like, mm, can, do you want to go in the other lane? And I was actually, no, I, I, this is quieter. I prefer swimming clockwise. So can I come in here? And then during the whole swimming, they were literally, so I couldn't tumble turn, they were like spreading themselves out. And actually I was trying, I was like, I'm gonna go as fast as I can to show them. And then actually when one of them swam, he was actually really slow. And I was like, actually, yeah. But for me, I think, uh, like it, I was like, oh my gosh, why, why is he doing that? But for me, I felt like, if I wanna do this, if I wanna um, try and swim with him, I wanna show it so it's, Yes, it's knocking me and it's knocking, I'm like, why, like, all that type of stuff. But actually, if I can try and prove a point to him that even though I'm a girl and, yes, I've got dwarfism, I can still swim as fast as other people. So, yeah, I had that. And it definitely, I feel like it's important now that we, again, still talking about um, having days like this, having a chance to chat and listen to you for incredible individuals and then talking about it, having International Women's Day as well on Friday. It's really important that we still make change. When they see you on a TV advert, they must be feeling really silly now. Yeah. When they see you on the television, they must feel really, really silly. But let's open, have we got more, two more questions, I'm being told. I'll let the mics come to you. Did anybody see that golfing clip recently as the yeah. mics come in? Yeah. Yeah. That just typifies, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Professional female golfer at the driving range, you've got a man yeah. next to her trying to critique her swing. 
to be fair, she she played it well, didn't she? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. she she yeah. was laughing. Um, so I've been swimming for nearly like eleven years. So I was oh, just brilliant. wondering how do you like overcome stuff and how have you been like improved both mentally and physically? Yeah, so I think for like I think we've touched upon it today. Using that support system around you is so so important. I know when I was a swimmer, um, majority of my swimming career, I was at school. Um, I was away a lot in school, but I use my teachers so, so much. And teachers are there, yes, to educate, but they're also there to, as a sounding board as well in the support system. So teachers play a massive, massive part. Um, and again, swim coach, swim teachers, or your, your peers as well. Like throughout my career, I use my, my uh, peers my teammates so, so much, um, especially when I was young on the team, I spoke to them about everything and the majority of them now are my best friends. Um, so you go through, go through a lot with each other. But I think overcome things, again, it's, I think what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, doesn't it? I think you learn from mistakes, you learn sometimes by people putting you down, it, grow, it makes you grow stronger. For me, when I was an athlete, I actually learned more about myself when a race didn't go to plan, or a race didn't go to well, because like yourself, Leila, when, you're, um, when things go, go well, you're like on a high, you're loving life, you're looking to the next challenge, you're like, I can do this, where for me, when a race didn't go well, I used to sit around with my team and like, we need to evaluate absolutely everything. What didn't go well? What can we improve for next time? So I think for what I'll say is just learn from things that don't go wrong and just become the woman that you are. I think whatever highs, lows, you know, also as well, life's a roller coaster. It's not always going to be amazing. There's always going to be down times. And just someone actually on Saturday tell me, told me a really good quote. Um, oh gosh, I forgot it now. It's just off ahead, but I'll say it. I wish I could help you out with this one. Yeah, I wasn't there, so. <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> it'll come back. It'll, I was going to literally just say it, but it just totally, it was a Tom Hanks quote, but I can't remember, but it'll come and pop in my head. But I hope you're enjoying swimming. And yeah, it's a really, really good sport. And yeah, it's good for all abilities. And actually, like totally random, but again, netball is amazing for all. Mm -hmm. It's my actually mom does the walking netball. Oh, yeah. And she's in her 70s. So it's great that sport is not just for the youngsters. It's for all ages and all abilities. Yeah, thank you for that question. We've got time for one more question. And I'll let everybody on the panel open it because we have gone oh, yeah. way over, but that's okay. Nice question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, Thanks, lady. Yeah. Is there any advice that you would give to young girls like us or anything you would tell your younger self like, to stay passionate about what you're doing? Yeah, I think, great question. I think for me, you know, never let anyone stop you from achieving your dreams. I think there was times, I think we touched upon it earlier, that there's people that won't understand what you want to do. And it's also, again, like Leila said, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do, but if you have a sport or you have a job that you actually know you want to do, don't let anybody, you know, stop you from achieving that. Because there was people that used to laugh at me, honestly, I can't even explain to you. Imagine a five or six year old being told, you can't do that, you're a girl. You know, and, it, and I never used to think about it then. I just used to want to play football. But um, I think my younger self, the one advice I'd give is maybe as I got older, not to act upon emotion because there were times when a coach, say, hadn't played me or something and I'd be really emotional and not be able to get my communication out. Mm -hmm. I think as I've got older, I've realised actually take a moment, sleep on it, and then you can have a better a better conversation. I think that's, that goes throughout life as well, to be honest. Yeah, yeah and for me, um, exactly, soak in each day. I think throughout my life, and even now sometimes, I'm always looking for that next challenge and that next thing and worrying about that next thing where actually just be grateful for every single day. And again, I know we've said it all a lot, but use that support system. It is the biggest thing that is around really, that whole support system, friends, family, loved ones, all of that, your school peers. It's really, really important that you use them for every single bit of advice. Yeah, for me, so I um, I had a couple of things. I actually used to swim, I swam for my county and um, played football as well. Um, and I really wish that I had really honed in and really gone for it for one of those, but I felt like my confidence held me back a little bit. So I would just say, if you'd like you said, you've got something you love, just go for it, absolutely go for it and just, just don't give up. Like you will have obstacles that come in your way, but you'll overcome them and your determination and sheer want for that will just really drive you. Um, and just always be yourself, 
always be yourself. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't be you or put you down or anything. There's, remember, for every one person that says something bad to you or puts you down, there'll be a hundred others that will tell you something really beautiful about yourself and give you that confidence boost. So go find those people and use your support system, as you said. Yeah. Amen to that. Leila? Um, yeah, I would say to my younger self to, to not be so hard on yourself. And I think we were talking about this earlier that you... In the moment, so many things can feel like failures or I remember getting a C on a test at school and I literally went home and sobbed to my mum about it. And now I look back and I can't even, I don't remember anything about it. And I think it's so hard. We live in a world where everything is about what grades you get. And I'm not telling you in front of your teachers not to get good grades or anything like that, but it is about what grades you get, what you win, what you do and that kind of thing. And it can be really hard to just really easy to be really tough on yourself when you don't achieve what you want to um, but I think we've already touched upon the fact that kind of all of those things just become learning experiences and opportunities and shape you into the people that you want to be so I would look back and think all those things I thought was such a big deal and I beat myself up about that they weren't as important in the grand scheme of life. And Stephanie? So it's all quite heavy, this, isn't it? Really, um, <laughs> sorry. I think, but I think, <laughs> but I think, recognizing your own emotions is something that I, I've really only pretty well just been learning the last five, ten years. It's like um, recognizing why you're feeling things is the first step to actually getting things right. Um, and you, you have a right to your emotions. If you're feeling something, you're absolutely allowed to feel that, and then it's working out why you're feeling it. But the, and, and when you recognise that, then you'll know that actually a lot of your emotions may be created irrationally. They, they might be fueled by something you shouldn't be listening to. Or, and then, and then the, the next thing I say is about breaking through your fear. Um, because we have all been told to be careful all our lives and that we might not deserve to be in sport or deserve to be because we're women. But, but the reality is that's not true. And, but to break through it, we all have to break through fear boundaries. And one way I use, because I mean, you know, I'm just like one else, you get scared of things, is to try and look ahead at 10 years' time and think, will I then look back on this and really think that mattered that much? You know, will it, will it be that big in my life in 10 years' time, the fact that I've mucked up on the stage or, you know, because doing public speaking is something I was terrified of when I was younger. But actually, if you just think, no, you know, look at all these people on the planet. Does it matter that much that one of them's got on the stage and mucked up a bit? And then in 10 years' time, you look back and think that was biggest stuff. Not really. Being embarrassed doesn't matter that much, actually. What other people say doesn't matter that much. It's all, you know, not that big. But you make it big. So it's just like sort of trying to sit away from yourself at times, I think, is a challenge. Yeah, well, that, that brings me to the end, unfortunately. I'm going to hand back to Sinead in a second. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for your questions. And give it up to my amazing panel, Ellie Sylvie Simon, Leila Buster, and Stephanie Horgan.